Hey, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co., and this is a list of my top 10 guilty pleasure games. Which I guess means we probably should start off by defining what do I mean is a guilty pleasure game? How do I define that term? What is this list actually going to be about? To me, a guilty pleasure game is a game that I like more than I think I should like. Not more than other people like, to be very clear. There are many games I have in my collection that I might like more than The Average. Aquatica, Carson City, Wild Ascent. There are a bunch of games out there that I believe my opinion is higher than the average opinion of that game. That happens. We all are unique, special snowflakes who all have our own opinions of what things are. And across the board, sometimes we align, sometimes we fall more where the masses are. But we'll always have the areas where we think a game is better than the, the masses and the game where we think the game is worse than the masses. That is not this video. This video is 10 games that I think I like more than I think I should like. I mentioned Carson City. Carson City is a fantastic game. All of you people who think it's a 7.4 or whatever it's up to right now, uh, you're all wrong. It's better than that. It's better than that, and I'm going to stand behind it. Versus these 10 games are not necessarily better than that. I, I like them. I like them a lot. They're here for a reason. All of these games are games I really enjoy, but arguably speaking, I enjoy them more than I think I should enjoy them. I'll also note that Marvel Zombies over here, or Zombicide in general as a system, is not one of those games. It's not. This is my number 11, and the reason it's here is because, in its own way, it is relevant to the conversation, but not because it's a guilty pleasure game in and of itself. I think Zombicide as a system is a fantastic system that has a lot of things going for it. I recognize it will not be for everyone. I recognize that it also stands for like that horde of plastic bloat that some people don't like. I recognize all the things that might make it a game that's not right for you, but it is an excellent game that is popular for a reason, and I think it, I think it delivers on what kind of experience it's trying to give you, and I think it genuinely is amazing. Why is it here? Because the amount of Zombicide I have, that is probably a bit into guilty pleasure. So let's start with my number 11. Let's start with number 11 over here, which is not Zombicide in of itself, like I said already. Rather, the amount of Zombicide I have. I have Black Plague. I have Green Horde. I have Zombicide Undead or Alive. I have Zombicide. I have Marvel Zombies over here. I have Zombicide Black Plague coming. That means I currently have five Zombicides, four of which I know that I like. Uh, Black White Death, I don't know if I will or won't like. Did I say I have Black Plague coming? I have White Death coming. So White Death, I don't know if I'll like, so who knows? We can put that in the maybe category. But I have these four already. The Zombicide, uh, we have Zombicide DCs is going to be coming out, and you know I'm going to be getting my hands on that, which means we're up to six iterations of Zombicide in my collection. And sure, I've so far managed to condense it down to like three or four Calyx Cubbies. It's not the end of the world as far as the space it takes up, but it is a little insane. And so Zombicide gets my number 11 spot, not for the game itself, but for the quantity of Zombicide that I have in my collection. The amount of Zombicide I have is definitely out of proportion with how good the game is. I think the game is good. I like the game a lot. It is not good enough to justify having six iterations of that game coming. And who knows whether I'll get rid of one of those iterations before the seventh iteration shows up. I just don't know yet. I have been successful at getting rid of Zombicide. I don't keep it for the sake of it. I've gotten rid of a... Uh, Second edition, I've gotten rid of the first three editions, I got rid of uh, Zombicide Invader. I have gotten rid of Zombicides when they didn't do what I wanted out of the system, so I'm not a blind uh, fan who does not have some degree of criteria in play. But blind fan or not, I definitely have more Zombicide than any human being should have, and the only people who make me look halfway decent are the people who own all of the Zombicide system. And so that's my number 11 pick, but it's not, again, it's a weird 11, because it's not really 11, it's a adjacent category for the quantity I have, as opposed to anything else. My number, my, number, my number 10 pick, and this list is not going to be in any particular order, I should note. It's not an order of what I think is the most best. There's just 10 games that are my guilty pleasure games. And I, I think I'm going to be ordering this in terms of box size, lowest to highest, just because it's practically easier to grab the games that way. My number 10 is Numsters. I think this is delightful. This is charming. Numsters is a button-shy game where you basically have a handful of cards and you're trying to have the numbers eat each other. It's a solo experience where you're trying to have three can eat four, but you have to have the eight card between them. That way you say three, eight, four. It's from the joke, you know, why was seven? Why was nine afraid of seven? Because seven, eight, nine. You see, it's an old joke and they turned it into a game, which is charming, but the game works well. It's a solo puzzle. You hold it in your hand. It's a great travel game. It's a lot of fun. And there's a fun little challenge in it as well that you, the goal of the game is to get down to one number left. And every card has a rule that breaks the system. So you can always eat a larger card that is off by one. So a three can eat a four, but not a five, and a four cannot eat a three. But you could use the number rule that will always vary based on whatever the top card is. That might make that might say something like 
the smallest number eats any larger number, or it might say an even number eats an odd number that's double digits, or whatever it is, have all these different rules. And so you can use either the always in play rule or the custom rule, and there's a little mini challenge of trying to be able to win with getting every single one of the different cards in the game as your last card standing, which gives you another way to play the puzzle. It's not just about winning, now it's about like, you know what, I've gotten the one, the seven, the nine over here, I need to win with the six now, because I'm trying to get that to happen, and so it forces your brain to slightly adjust to a specific way to win. I like this game a lot, far, far more than I think I should. It is a small, simple solo challenge that is not that variable. It's the same puzzle every single time, and yet I really enjoy it and have a lot of fun with it. And to this day, it's one of my go-to travel games because of how easy it is to table. My number nine is going to be another small box game, and this is Cockroach Poker, which is amazingly fun, but I don't know why. A, a long time ago, one of the first bluffing games I ever had was a game called Coup. I loved Coup. I thought it was excellent. I got Coup Rebellion. I got Coup Rebellion G54, whatever it's called. I don't know. I got all the various versions of Coup, the expansions, everything. And I, I, then I went back to regular Coup, because regular who worked well for me, but eventually Koo got kind of got replaced. It got replaced by Skull, another bluffing game that's very easy, very charming. I found Skull was lighter on the uh, the rules of the rules, and therefore it was easier to table as a game. And so Skull became our go-to bluffing party game, albeit many parties, our go-to bluffing game for a long time. I will say along the way, I have had Sheriff of Nuttingham for a very long time, and still have Sheriff of Nuttingham. It is an excellent experience. It is a little longer, so it's not as good as the filler bluffing game. But then Skull got replaced by Cockroach Poker, and eventually I got rid of Koo and Skull because Cockroach Poker is the only game in this category my group currently plays. This is the game we pull out at the end of a long night when we have, you know, half an hour left and we want to sit down and we play a game, and so we end up playing this for two and a half hours, or not two and a half hours, an hour and a half. We'll play three, four games because we had half an hour left, and we just dive into Cockroach Poker and have way too much fun with this. The general goal of the game is you're placing cards down and you say, hey, this is a spider. I actually don't remember if there's spiders. I don't think there's spiders. You say, this is a rat. If you say it's a spider, they'll probably know you're wrong. You say, when you go ahead and you pass that card, they go ahead and they can either call your bluff or not, or they can look at it and then pass to the next person. And that's where the fun comes in, because they look at that card and they're like, it is a rat. Or maybe they say, that's not a rat, that's a bat. And they pass to the next person. Which means as the card gets passed around the table, players are being given more and more information about the various lies or confirmations of something that may or may not be true that's happening. And that the puzzle further evolves, because the way you lose the game is by having four of the same type of creature in front of you. Which means suddenly, as soon as I have three rats in front of me, the whole puzzle changes, because now it's just not a random card that's being passed. When I pass you a card and I say, it's a rat. You have to be able to call my bluff or not. Your goal is to call me out. If I'm telling the truth, you want to say, you're telling the truth and call me on it. If I'm telling a lie, you want to say, you're telling a lie. You just want to be able to predict what I'm doing and that will define whether you get the card or not. And that leads to these mind games that are so satisfying, but it's so stupid too. It's stupid. It's mindless. I'm not saying it's not a good game. I'm, I think all of these games that I'm going to talk about today are good games. But I think there's a difference between being a good game and being a game that I really enjoy as much as I do these games. And I do not understand why Cockroach Poker is as enjoyable as it is. But for whatever reason, it works. And for whatever reason, it's a guilty pleasure game. It's working on my entire group. Then we have The Mind, which isn't even a game. And it's a game that I, or it's not a game, it's an experience that I should have gotten rid of by now because I've won this so many times. But the way the mind works is you basically get a card. The card is between 1 and 100. There's a deck of cards, all the numbers between 1 and 100, and to each player at the table, you give them one card. You're just one card. Maybe you're playing a two-player game, I get a card, you get a card. The only thing I know is that your number is between 1 and 100, and it's not the same number as mine because that can't happen. There's only one copy of each card. You know the exact same thing. And then you and I cannot talk to each other. We can't. We're not allowed to talk to each other. So what we do now is we sit there and we just hold the card. And at some point, you play your card. But when you play your card, the goal is to play your card on the table in ascending order. But how can you do that if you're not talking to each other? How do I know if you have a 90? How do I know if I have a 5? I don't. I, I mean, I know what I have. How do I know if you have a 5? And the answer, to a certain extent, is you just wait until the moment feels right. And at some point along the way, you're like, well, if you had a 1, you would have played it by now. So you don't have a 1, but do you have a 2, a 3, a 17, a 19, a 24? What's the right amount of pausing that's present for this game? And then when you're done with that, you hand each player 2 cards, and then 3 cards, then 4 cards, and all the way up to anywhere between 8 to 12 cards, depending on the player count you're playing with. So at some point, you can have 4 players at the table, each with 8 cards in their hands, 32 cards that need to be played in ascending order, or you will lose the experience. It is such a ridiculously stupid concept that works so well. And the way I work with this game is I play it, and I play it again, and I play it again, and eventually I win. And then I stop playing it for six months, while I let myself forget how exciting it is, and then I pull it back off the shelf and play it again. 
it is I've gotten so much fun out of this game. It is so good. It is so satisfying. That moment when you and your group, whether it's two people, whether it's all four, when you have that mind melding of an experience where you get into each other's heads and you feel the vibe and you feel the tempo and you play the cards down, the mind does not fail to deliver. And yet it's so stupid and I barely call it a game. It's basically just wait and pause and play a number. There's no communication. There's no real sense of strategy. It's just a bunch of cards and a bunch of people having way too much fun making stupid choices at 2 a.m. in the morning. My number three pick, that was my number three. My number four pick is going to be Las Vegas. Las Vegas is ridiculously light, but man, this game is so good. You see, Las Vegas is basically a game where you're going to be rolling your dice. You're going to be rolling a handful of dice, and then you place all your numbers that match certain casinos on the table. There's going to be casinos that number between 1 to 6 on the table, and each of those casinos has a stack of bills below it. You're trying to win the bills at the casino. So I might sit there, and I might, maybe I roll two, two twos. Maybe I roll them one three, and maybe I roll three fours. I have a bunch of choices, but ultimately I'm picking one type of number. So I'm either picking the twos, the threes, the, the single three, or all the fours, I'm picking a single type of number, and I'm placing all of them in that casino. And whoever has the most dice at each casino will win the money there. So you are looking at the distribution of cash at each casino, which will vary, but also you're looking at who has what dice at the casino and how hard they're fighting for that. Because a big part of the game that makes it so stupid and yet so fun is if players have an equal amount of dice at the casino, they cancel each other out and you go to the next player down. So if you have three dice and I have three dice, the next player has two dice, that player is getting the money there. Now there's some additional rules of distribution of how things work, but the core principle is roll dice, assign them to casinos, and then watch people slowly but surely bump each other out as they fight way too hard to double down on the thing that they shouldn't have doubled down on because it wasn't good for the strategy, but now they're invested and now they're playing dice and people are just going crazy and some other player goes ahead and plays one dice and manages to get a hundred dollar bill off the casino because other people are being stupid and they're too emotionally invested in their decision making. It's so good. It's so good, and it plays at such different age ranges, and it works so well at different age ranges. You can play with a bunch of adults, you can play with a, a bunch of kids, you can play with adults and kids mixed together, and everyone is having their own ridiculously good time because the rules are simple and the experience is bonkers. I think it's so... It's so light. Like, why is this still here? You see, every single month, if you watch my videos, first of all, if you don't watch my videos, please subscribe to the channel, I appreciate it. Also, I have a Patreon, I appreciate any support you give over there. But, if you watch my videos... If you watch the videos I put out on my channel on a regular basis about the games I'm getting rid of, you see all the amazing games that leave my shelves all the time. I cannot keep everything, and yet, these games, so far these four games, are surviving each and every purge. We have six versions of Zombicide, we have Las Vegas, Crack uh, Cockroach Poker, The Mind and Numbsters are surviving while I sit there and I get rid of Indonesia from Splatter Games. What is wrong with me? My next pick, number five. It's one of my go-to game recommendations. It's a game I recommend to everyone who is asking for a gateway recommendation. It is my go-to gateway game. And I'm okay with that. There's nothing wrong with being an excellent gateway game. The thing that is surprising to me is how much I still enjoy this every single time I play Baron Park. Again, I think I think there are good gateway games. Like I think Timeline is a great gateway game. You know how often Timeline hits the shelf, hits the table? Very infrequently. But Baron Park, I play this all the time. And I still have fun with it. I will play it with regular gamers. I will play it with my kids. I will play it with whoever wants to play this game. I have the expansion, but I'll play it with or without the expansion. The only thing I won't do is I try not to play it without the goals. That is a module you can do where you don't have the goals in play, but that's less satisfying to me. But Baron Park is a polyomino game, and to me it's one of the most satisfying polyomino experiences out there still after all this time. Yes, Foundations of Rome is amazing. So is Planet Unknown. So is Project L and a dozen other great polyomino games. But Baron Park is still one of the most successful, one of the easiest to teach, one of the easiest to play. It is a game that is always the game when someone who is a non-gamer is asking for recommendations for themselves, for their kids, for whoever, my first go-to recommendation is Baron Park. Because I think it's so good to play, and I think it works at so many different skill levels and player levels, and it's so satisfying to grab those polyomino's and place them in the park and score up your park at the end of it and try to complete things. One of the things that some polyomino games try to be clever by not really focusing on having you complete what you're doing with the polyominoes. And I think that's interesting and it leads to interesting decisions, but sometimes it takes away the sheer fun of taking a piece of tile that is not a regular shape, placing it down on the board, and having everything now be complete. 
So many games miss that mark. I mean, even Planet Unknown, which I think is fantastic, you don't really finish your planet, so to speak. There's reasons to complete rows and columns, but you never really finish your planet. Project, uh, Foundations of Rome is amazing and it's incredible, but you're not really finishing your own board. You're kind of placing things down in a city together, and so it doesn't have that same sense of accomplishment. Project L, you have miniature little tiles. Uh, Isle of Cats, you're not really filling the board, the board, so to speak. You're filling sections of the board. Baron Park gets it right. Baron Park incentivizes pure polyomino placement in a way where you are trying to fill as much as possible, and you, usually, most of the time, you will. But it's so light. Like Les Vegas before, it's just a light experience. I'm not saying it's a bad experience. I think, again, I think all these games are good, but the fact that I'm still playing Baron Park, the fact that I've gotten rid of so many other games, Baron Park is definitely, to me, the, the level of lightness and accessibility this game has, and yet the amount that I still enjoy it, has me definitely considering it one of my guilty pleasure games. Number six is going to be another Marvel title, and that was unintentional. I use this as just a generic zombicide copy, but this one's definitely Marvel. This is Marvel United. I love Marvel United. I don't know why I love Marvel United, but I love Marvel United. And to be very clear, the first time I played Marvel United, I was disappointed. The first time I pulled out a core set, the Walmart core set, the first thing that showed up on anyone's doorsteps well before the Kickstarter ever arrived, and you had that simple core set with like eight heroes, whatever it was, and some basic cards, and I sat down and I played it, I was like, it's okay. But the more I played it, as I got more content for the game, as the Kickstarter arrived, as I started playing through more of the stuff, and as the more interesting villains and some of the more interesting heroes, to some degree, it's a limit of how interesting the game actually is, as, the, as those things showed up, and as the variety was there, I started to enjoy it more and more. And this is a game that I would say most of my plays of Marvel United have not even been with my kids. Yes, I play with my kids. Yes, I have a good time playing with my kids. And I think it's a great game. I've played this game solo. I've played this game with my kids. And I've played this game with my regular game group members. And I've played it most with that last category, which is astounding to me. Do you realize how light this game is? I mean, some it gets a little more interesting. In fact, Spider Geddon over here, Spider Geddon is my recommendation for if you're looking to experience Marvel's, uh, if you're looking to experience Marvel United, and you want to see what this game has to offer, both a little bit more complexity than the base core set. I think this is the core set to get your hands on. It'll be cheap, it'll be affordable, and I think it gives you a lot more interesting stuff than the basic, normal, typical core set. And they've learned and iterated upon the system along the way, but it's still ultimately just drawing some cards and playing some cards and making the obvious choices to stay alive. I do not think the decision space is nearly as complex as what I want from a typical gaming experience. When I sit there and I defend Marvel Zombies or the Zombicide system in general, I will do that, and I have a harder time doing that with Marvel United. It's not that I don't think it's good, it's that it, it, it's light, it's a light experience. You play cards down, you do the symbols, you, you try not to die, and then you either win because you play decently, or you lose because Rhino charged you too hard and killed everyone in your spot. These things happen in the game, but it's, I don't know why. I don't know why it's as rewarding as it is, but it is as rewarding as it is. That's the key thing. Forget the why, forget the how. I like this game so much, and I, I mean, it, it does also fall in the category that Zombicide falls into, where I have three entire seasons of this game coming, and I will reluctantly probably continue to spend money on it that I shouldn't. I like Marvel United a lot, but there's no question at all that it fits the category of being a guilty pleasure game. My number seven. My number seven, I debated. I did, because I think it's arguably, outside of Zombicide itself, I think my number seven is arguably the best game from a, from looking at the game, I think it's arguably the best game. And that's Rolling Dice. It's not my favorite game, but I'm trying to be critical about things that I appreciate versus areas I think I've been some way magically pulled in. I think Rolling Heights might be the best game on this table. But also I think Rolling Heights is mostly as fun as it is because you're rolling meeples into a box. So I'm not entirely sure. Rolling Heights from AEG and from John D. Clare is a game about rolling meeples into a box, like I just said. The general idea of the game is you're trying to build out the, 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 the board. You have a shared board, you're building up buildings, you're doing so for a variety of reasons. Each building will give you points, there's some objectives in play, you have personal goals, you have all these things to balance and be mindful of. But ultimately, the game comes down to the fact that you start with a few meeples, you roll the meeples in the box, the meeples that are left standing, they're helpful. The meeples that aren't, not so helpful. And you do that as efficiently as possible, trying not to bust. A bust is when you roll the remaining meeples and no one lands on their feet in any way, shape, or form. That's when you bust, and that is just sadness and... Everyone took away your Halloween candy that year because you don't get anything. That's not true. You do get something, which is why it's actually kind of worth busting in the beginning. That's a whole different conversation about strategy that we're not going to get into. But the important part is that Rolling Heights, 
I think is mostly as fun as it is because you're rolling meeples into a box. I'm not saying the game isn't good. I think the game is good. But I think the standout aspect of Rolling Heights is that you are rolling meeples into a box and something about the process is so much more satisfying than rolling a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, whatever number you're going for. You know, because they have that, that aspect where a meeple standing on its feet when it lands is like a 6. That's the best number. And then meeple that's kind of in any way on its side that's not flat mm -hmm. on its back, that's like, you know, a 4 or 5. And then a 1, 2, and 3 is a miss. Now, I don't know what their exact ratios are. I don't know exactly what the exact odds are. But all I know is when you throw a bunch of meeples in the box and they don't land flat on their back, it is so satisfying. And so, like, this entire game works off that system. But I don't feel like it works off that system. I have to think about it critically and be like, but, like, the game is good. Like, the game is, it's not a bad game. It's just, it's a good game. It's just a good game that's magnified by having these meeples be rolled into a box in a way that makes the experience better. But it does make the experience better. That's the key thing. That's the takeaway. The takeaway here is that it does make the experience better. That's the takeaway. I like Rolling Heights. A lot. My number eight. My number eight is Millie Fiori. Millie Fiori over here is more fun than I thought it would be at first. Millie Fiori from Devere Games is a game that is going to have you placing tiles down, drawing cards, you're drafting cards, you're placing those cards down, the cards determine which of the like, six different areas on the board you're placing your tiles down. You have these little crystal see-through tiles that go on the board, and different areas will score differently and give you different bonus plays, which are basically extra turns, as well as bonus points, which are basically getting 20, 15, 10, or 5 points. And then each area has its own way that it scores, so you're trying to be mindful of the scoring, the bonus plays, and the extra turn, and the extra points in each of these areas. The game system is very light. And the game system often devolves into like, oh, someone has to block that person from doing that. Or, oh, that person's getting so many points because they found a nice engine. Oh, look at that. That person won with 382 points. And I have 241. And it's like, it's just a ton of points being handed out. But every time I've played Milli Fiori, I've had a great time with it. Every time I've gotten to this table, it has reinforced that I'm having fun with this system. Like, I don't know if it stays forever. And all these games, all these games, there's no guarantee that they're forever games. There's no guarantee. I think, I mean, a lot of these have been around for a long time, so I think a decent amount. I mean, I think Millie Fiori is arguably the most recent here, so maybe that's the one that's in most danger, but it's just so good. The first time I played it, I was like, this is fun, but I'll play it again because, like, you know, I'm reviewing it, but, like, I don't need to own this game. And then I played it again, and I, I enjoyed it, and it's just sat on my mind. And even now, as I'm talking to you about it, I kind of want to pull it out and play it. The card quality, kind of junk, honestly, but uh, the, the rest of the components are, are solid. They're nice little tokens you put down on the board. And something about the process of just trying to score an extra 20 points, an extra 20 points, and doing that little chaining. Oh, look at that. I got a bonus play into a bonus play into a, like an extra 20-point bonus. And boom, go ahead and ratchet me up like 52 points. There's something satisfying about those turns because you just got 52 points in one turn, but you'll do that. Is it the most strategic game? No, far from it. Is it, like, arguably not that well-balanced? I can make a strong argument that's not that well-balanced. Is there the absolute problem that if you're playing this with more than two players, you will find yourself in a situation where somebody is snowballing in points, and unless somebody is willing to sit there and tank them, they will continue snowballing in points? Yes, that will happen. That absolutely not will happen. Some games it's happened for me, some games it hasn't. But it can happen in the game where you are forced to collectively either agree or just let the other person win. Those are all problems with the game. But I have fun with it. And I want to keep playing it. So um, here we are. My number nine. My number nine is... Um, I'm debating whether I reverse the order of these. You know what? I will reverse the order of these. I'm going to do my number nine over here. The line is going to be ten. And again, I said, I said there's no order. I did say there's no order. There's no official order here. But I think that my number... Now my, now my number ten, I think, is uh, noteworthy in its own right. Number nine over here is Valeria Card Kingdoms. I'll also say I don't like the big box. I mean, it's functional. I don't like the way it looks. And the, I, I like the better ones in a smaller box. Either way, I kind of want to get the smaller box back now. I don't think I can unring that bell. Valeria Card Kingdoms is one of those many Catan... Not knockoffs, but Catan adjacent games. You have games like Machi Crow, you have games like Space Base, you have games like Bad Company, you have games like Valeria Card Kingdoms, all of which involve rolling a few dice and everyone at the table gets resources on their turn. That's the core premise of the game. That's all it is. That's all it is. You're just trying to roll dice and get stuff. You start with a 5 and a 6, and if you roll 5s or 6s, you get stuff. Also, if you roll a 2 and a 3 together, that adds up to 5, so you get stuff in that too. In fact, if you roll a 2 and a 3, you will get everything that's a 2 or a 3 and the things that are a 5. And so you're just trying to get stuff. That's what you're trying to do in this game. 
And then you use those stuff to go ahead and fight monsters. You can use some of your tokens and you fight monsters and you defeat the monster rows. And eventually, if you defeat all the monsters, you'll win the game or you the game and game will trigger, I should say, instead. There's also these various domains you can go ahead and try to get your hands on these various domains in the game by trading in. They'll give you either just points in general or they'll give you various either one-time abilities or activate abilities or ongoing abilities. All these things are present in the game. And there's expansions that add a bunch of things. Anything from new, new, new areas to go to to a full cooperative mode that totally changes the way you play the game. There's a lot of fun things going on in the game. And yet the reason it's a guilty pleasure game is because Blizzard Card Kingdoms could otherwise be known as Resources the Board Game. Because you roll dice and you get stuff. And you keep getting stuff. This is the least resource starved game you will ever find. There is too much stuff entering the mix. There's constant resources being thrown at you and it's intentional because you start with a card, a duke so to speak, that will uh, give you a scoring criteria where you'll score for different things including the amount of resources you have at the end of the game. Which means the game really is totally fine with the fact that you'll be like, hey, by the way, I know it's the end of the game but I have like 20 extra fight and 50 extra money and 10 extra mana. Look at me, I have 80 resources, that'll be 20 points there. But that's part of the game experience, and it's not about limited resources. So often game decisions are about how you operate with limited resources. In the case of Valeria Card Kingdoms, it's about how you operate with limited actions and where your resources most efficiently spent, but don't worry, you probably have those resources most of the time. It's a little silly, it's a little over the top, but it's just a fun game that I've enjoyed almost all the expansions. I've enjoyed the, uh, the cooperative mode as well, and I've just had fun with the experience since the first time I played it. But I definitely recognize that I think I like it more than it deserves to be liked because I think it's a little crazy on the whole resource department and the way that operates, and yet I still have fun with it. My, my, my game group has fun with it. My kids have fun with it. It is just a good game to play. My number 10 gets the number 10 spot, not necessarily because it's the biggest gap between, I don't know, how much I feel I should like it, but because my number 10 is a game I've played now. I'd have to look at my log plays, but I've played this game close to 200 times by now which is stupid. It's just stupid. But my number 10 is My City. My City from Cosmos is a game that I can't stop playing. I'm in the middle of two active sessions right now of this game. I just finished playing through My City, Roll and Build, Roll and Build, I think it's called Roll and Build, and this particular version of the game, this, this one right here, I have played this nearly 200 times, around 100 times using physical copies of the game where you play through it because you see, you can get 24 plays out of this game. 24 plays. It's a legacy game, it's a polyomino legacy game, and you can get 24 plays out of it before it's done. But also, if you play it two players, you can get 48 plays out of it because of the fact that you have double the components. I've had two full copies of this game. I'm still in the middle of this one, so a little less than 100 plays out of the physical copy of this game. And then around 100 plays because I've played through this like four full times on BGA and Borg Marina, and I've continued to dive into it as well. It is an easy game to play. It, it plays in half hour long sessions. It's so much fun to just like place your polyominoes, learn the new thing that's coming because each, each game, each session adds something new to it. And so you get a little rule adjustment, and you keep playing it. You get another rule adjustment, and you keep playing it. And before you know it, you just spent two and a half hours playing five sessions of My City, and now you're debating whether you just play one more session, because that might complete the chapter arc for you, because the arcs come in like three episode arcs. It's so much fun. I like it a lot. My only real complaint is that I'm trying to finish My Island at this point, and My Island I'm only just in the middle of, because I started My Island, but I didn't finish My Island, and so I need to pl finish and play through My Island, but I've managed to... Uh, finish and play through My City Roll and Build in the meantime, which is almost as charming. It's not as good because it's more chaos and less planning. There's actually planning in here, but it is great for traveling, and so there is that aspect, and so I like the game. It's a good game. It's a fun game. It's got a little scratch in the box, too, which is sad. That's sad. It's really, really sad. But the point is, like, I, I again, I think this is a good game. Every single game on this table I recommend without hesitating at all. But the amount of time I've spent on My City is a little insane, considering how good this game actually is. It's not that good. It does, by the way. It does do that thing that Baron Park does well, where you're actually trying to fill up your board. Again, it's satisfying to place polyominoes in a way that actually fills up the area. That is satisfying. Someone tell, that, someone tell game designers that is the fun of polyominoes. The fun of polyominoes is filling things up. Heck, even Uwe Rosenberg, a feast for Odin, he gets it. You don't have to be super clever about like places to go. Just fill up your board. Just have fun and fill up your board. It's it's a little addicting. Board games are a little addicting. I might have a problem. I might genuinely have a problem. I mean, we talked about 200 plays in my city. I might, I might, I might have a problem. But that's this list. That is the list of my top 10 guilty pleasure games. Games that I genuinely enjoy. Games that I easily recommend, but games that I think I like more than I should. Which doesn't mean anything. Because at the end of the day, if you like something, enjoy it. Have fun with it. 
In fact, what are your guilty pleasure games? What's a game? What's a game? Two games? Three games? What are games that you play that you kind of think you shouldn't enjoy as much as you should? And I'm not, say, I'm not saying you should. You should continue to enjoy that. I don't care if it's Cards Against Humanity, Monopoly, Catan. I don't care what game it is. If you're having fun with an experience, have fun with it. Don't let someone else yuck your yum. If they don't enjoy it, that's okay. They can play something else. I guarantee you they have something else that's equally stupid. At the end of the day, all of us are sitting here and like fighting plastic dragons and planting fake crops and simulating life experiences instead of leading our own. We're all kind of lost in a little bit of imagination and just having a good time. So however you want to do it, do it to the best of your ability. Lead your best life and have a lot of fun. In any case, until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Co. I hope you enjoyed this video, and as always, I hope you have a good one.